All right, you're now going to hear from Paulina Lucio Mamon, whose talk emphasizes the relationship between policy outcomes and recognizing all salient perspectives in addressing the well being of indigenous people in Mexico. So, Paulina, please welcome Paulina. Thank you. Before I start, I want to thank Derek and Laura for the opportunity to speak to you today. I will talk about four simple rules for policymaking in the case of indigenous peoples in Mexico. I will argue that failing to do DSRP analysis before the implementation of public policy and legislation will lead to unintended consequences that can be disastrous for some social groups. Now, imagine yourself waking up on January the 1st, 1994 in Mexico. After a very fun New Year's Eve party, turning on your TVs and watching this image. That day, thousands of indigenous men and women with ski masks and arms in hand declared war on the Mexican government. They identified themselves as the Zapatista Army of National Liberation, and they were rebelling against the free market model enshrined in North America's free trade agreement that came into force that same day. Particularly, they were rebelling against the privatization of community-owned land. Zapatista's motto was, today we say enough. Indigenous communities in my country have been fighting for centuries to preserve their land and local forms of organization and government. After many years of struggle and negotiation, finally, in 2001, the Mexican government reformed Article 2 of the Mexican Constitution, granting indigenous communities in the country the right to self-determination, self-governance, and autonomy. This means that indigenous communities in Mexico can elect their own authorities based on their traditions and practices and can apply their own legal systems for solving internal conflicts. This was a great time for indigenous communities in Mexico. However, not all the members of these communities benefited from the application of communitarian laws and practices. In fact, indigenous women became victims of such practices as they prevent them from being elected as authorities in their communities and from exercising their right to due process in judicial cases. These were unintended consequences of the new legislation. When granting indigenous communities the right to solve determination and self-government, the Mexican government failed to make a clear distinction of indigenous people in the country, to protect women as members of indigenous communities, to understand the unique relationships and patterns of discrimination against these women, and to adopt different perspectives towards the issue of indigenous people's rights, all of which led the human rights violation against indigenous women. Let's begin with the distinction problem. Sorry, with the distinction problem. There is no universal definition of indigenous people. In fact, every country and every organization has its own perspective of definition based on some of the following criteria. Speakers of an indigenous language, self-identification, belonging to a family with at least one member that self-identifies as indigenous or speaks an indigenous language. In Mexico, there are three federal institutions in charge of measuring and monitoring the indigenous population in the country. As you can see, each one of them has its own perspectival definition and consequently its own number. This shows that the Mexican government does not have a clear idea who can actually exercise the right to solve determination and self-governance in the country. That is a big distinction problem. Ignoring the parts of a complex system, as I mentioned, indigenous women became victims of the application of communitarian laws and practices. Today, we will speak about two cases, emblematic cases that illustrate this. Adriana Manzanares, she's an indigenous woman from the state of Guerrero, a southern state in Mexico. She became pregnant at the age of 20, and the father of her child was not her husband, who had migrated to the United States years earlier. She suffered a miscarriage, and her father accused her before a communitarian assembly for abortion and adultery. She was sentenced by this communitarian assembly to be stoned and humiliated in public. The story doesn't end there. She was later prosecuted by the public prosecutor of Guerrero and sentenced to 22 years of prison for the crime of murder. Abortion is not legal in the state of Guerrero. She could not defend herself because she only spoke Lapaneco and her defense was not translated. After spending seven years in prison, she was finally released by a ruling from the Mexican National Supreme Court. The Rosina Cruz, she's also an indigenous woman. She's from the state of Oaxaca. She was born in a community, a Zapotec community known as Santa Maria Piegolani. She left her, her town very young. She went to school, became a teacher, and years later, 
returned to her hometown to run for mayor in 2007. After winning the election, the Electoral Council ordered for all the votes that were cast in her favor to be disregarded. She appealed the decision with no success, and she was not allowed to take public office. Why? Because communitarian rules do not allow women to be authorities in their community. This case shows that at the... One, one thing before I say that. She, later on, she ran for a seat in Congress, in Oaxaca State Congress, she won it. And then she became a Congresswoman in Mexico's National Congress. She has been advocated in favor of indigenous women's rights since then. And this shows that in the state and federal level, women's rights are protected by the Constitution. At the municipal level, gender equality and communitarian law collide. The third rule, the Mexican government also failed to understand the unique relationship that shapes indigenous women's rights. Indigenous women are usually poor, they usually don't speak Spanish, they are indigenous, and they are women. So it is these sets of identities that put indigenous women in a position of vulnerability in each of their social relations. The relationship analysis is vital to understand how a public policy might impact people's access to rights and opportunities differently. The case of Adriana Manzanares is very illustrative to show this. She was sown and humiliated pursuant to communitarian law, then imprisoned for abortion pursuant to state law, and she could not defend herself because she did not speak Spanish. The adoption of different perspectives. The Mexican government approached the issue of indigenous people's rights from a collective rights perspective. Collective rights are justified only insofar as the collective self-rule of the group advances the individual autonomy of its members. As we have seen in this case, female members of the indigenous group have been in fact abused by the collective self-rule of the group. So this shows the need to integrate an individual rights perspective into the policy and legislation. And secondly, indigenous rights, as any other human rights, should not be applied with a gender neutral lens. Policies impact men and women differently. So a gender perspective is vital to protect indigenous women and to empower them for they, so they can have access to the management of resources and have a say in the representation of their group. This case has shown the power of the SRP, failing to make distinctions, to identify the parts of a complex system, to understand the underlying relationships of the system and to adopt different perspectives before implementing public policy will lead to unintended consequences. As Derek and Laura argue, wicked problems result from the mismatch between how real world systems work and how we think they work. Therefore, it is fundamental that policymakers and system thinkers in general constantly analyze the feedback that the real world is sending us in order to adapt our mental models. That is why I'm proposing this new model. I believe that the application of the SRP analysis into policy and legislation in an indigenous communities in Mexico will lead to the protection of indigenous women's human rights. This means that the Mexican government needs to make a clear distinction of indigenous people in the country, including gender statistics. Implement affirmative action measures to empower indigenous women as members of indigenous communities to intervene at different levels, to impact the unique relationship that shapes indigenous women's lives, and finally, to incorporate a gender perspective into policies and legislation. So let us hope that policymakers start adopting their mental models based on the feedback that the real world is sending them. Thank you. Thank you, Paulina.